Hi, welcome to the unabridged audiobook for Undead Ultra. I'm Apocalypse author Camille Peacott. If you enjoy this content, please support me and my books by subscribing to this channel and hitting the notification bell so you can be alerted when new audiobooks and new book-related content is posted. I hope you enjoy the story. Thanks for tuning in. Chapter 19 Bonk Mile 33 We walk. The bonk still drags at us, but we continue to put one foot in front of the other. Our feet press into the soil and rocks, swishing through weeds. The rotting ties creak beneath our shoes. My stomach feels like it's been scraped clean with a spoon. Everything hurts. Blisters throb, knee aches, skull feels like it's going to split in half. Cattails and burrs speckle me from ankle to thigh. They scratch at me through the compression pants, some of them having wormed beneath the fabric. The dozens of small cuts on Federico's legs have left tiny trails of blood all across his skin. Still, we walk. Stout never strays from our side. Her ears are on constant alert, swiveling at sounds we can't hear. I take heart in the fact that she'll sense a zombie before we will. She's only been with us for a few hours, but I already feel like she's family. We pass vineyards, farm pastures, and open space with native oak trees. The railroad meanders back and forth with the natural curves of the land always taking us north. The freeway moves in and out of sight. The farther north we go, the more relieved I am to be on foot. We've passed so many wrecked cars I've lost count. Zombies wander the highway and nearby land. So far, we've been lucky that none have come near the railroad. Still, I keep my eyes peeled, constantly scanning the land. The rest of my energy goes into propelling myself forward, one step after another, until I get to Arcata. And Carter. If I don't collapse first. Don't think like that, I berate myself. Tell me why you started running. Federico's strained voice jars me. What? I ask stupidly, blinking through my haze of concentration. I told you why I started running. He replies, You never told me why you started. There's a rough edge to his voice that I recognize. I've only heard him like this a few times, all of them at tough ultra races. Federico's at his lowest. He needs me to help distract him from the pain of his fuel-deprived state. I need someone to distract me from my fuel-deprived state. Suck it up, I tell myself. Frederico needs you. I take a long sip of water, then speak. I started running to... to get away from Kyle. The truth sends a pang through me even after all these years. I told everyone it was because I was trying to lose post-pregnancy weight. I even told myself that. It was partially true. But Kyle and I were lost. We lost each other in parenthood, work, and school. I waited tables at night. Kyle went to school and worked part-time as an office manager for his parents. We hardly saw each other. When I went to work at night, he stayed up late, drinking. In the morning, when he didn't have to work or go to school, he'd be hung over and in no shape to spend time with me and Carter. I'd be angry that he was hung over, but too wimpy to speak up. So I'd put Carter in the stroller and go out running. Sometimes I couldn't stand being home with him. It didn't matter how hard or how fast I ran. Things didn't get better. At first, my runs with Carter were short. Kyle was depressed when we went out without him, so he started drinking during the day. My runs got longer. I'd go out for two, three, four hours at a time. The longer I was out, the more he'd drink. He started skipping school and work. I felt guilty for our situation. I was angry and resentful about everything. Parenthood had been a shock for us both, and I thought he needed the drinking to de-stress. 
I thought he regretted marrying me and having Carter. I thought he needed me to take care of him by buying him beer. How fucked up is that? I was so angry that he was drinking all the time, and I kept buying him beer because I thought I was taking care of him. One day, I ran twenty miles to my parents' house and didn't go home. I swallow, throat tight with the memory. Even after all this time, the memory of the pain is vivid and raw. I stayed with my parents for six weeks, trying to sort out my feelings for Kyle. I had just about convinced myself our marriage had been a big mistake, and then... Again, my throat tightens. And then, Frederico prompts, huffing along beside me. Kyle came to my parents' house and told me he'd joined Alcoholics Anonymous and quit drinking. It was two in the morning. I'd gotten home from my shift in the restaurant, and he'd been waiting outside. I remember the way my stomach turned at the sight of him getting out of his car. He said he loved me. He loved Carter, and he would do whatever he had to to save our family and our marriage. He already had an AA sponsor. He'd been sober for sixteen days. He was so earnest, so sincere. I, I decided that any man willing to work so hard to save our marriage was a man I wanted to meet halfway. Tears prick the corner of my eyes at the memory. Carter and I moved back home the next day. I started going to Al-Anon meetings. We got a marriage counselor. Things got better. Things got good. Great, even. I fall silent, letting out a long, shaky breath. I've never told anyone that story before. Retelling it now brings back all my shame. Shame that I had been ready to give up on us, on our family. Shame that I had encouraged Kyle's addiction. Shame that I had run away from Kyle and our problems. I feel like the dysfunctional, codependent, scared young woman all over again. I don't like that part of myself. No matter how far or how hard I run, I can't get away from her. It's the same part of me that went to pieces when Kyle died. There's a weakness inside myself I can't escape. In some ways, relationships aren't so different from ultra-running, Frederico says. Once you decide you're going to make it to the finish line, you will. Doesn't matter what hell you encounter on the way. Is that the subconscious appeal of ultra-running? Do I run to prove to myself that I was good enough for Kyle? Good enough for the man who loved me so completely? The man I almost walked away from? How many miles will it take before I've proved to myself that I was worth loving? I remember I'm supposed to be lifting my friend out of a bunk. A depressing story likely isn't helping him. Anyway, that's why I started running. I continue, trying to make my tone lighthearted. You know how it goes. Before I knew it, I was signed up for my first 50-kilometer race. 50 kilometers is equivalent to 31 miles. They're considered the shortest ultramarathon distance. I never looked back after that or stopped running. Chapter 20 If I Get Eaten I glance at him. How are you feeling? He grunts. A little better. His face is pinched, the toll of the bonk still playing on his features. I need to be strong for my friend and help him through this funk. How can I distract him and keep his mind off the pain? Depressing stories obviously isn't the way. If I hadn't been bonking myself, I'd never have told him that story. I attempt to steer the conversation in a more light-hearted direction. Let's play If We Get Eaten by Zombies in the Next Thirty Minutes. Frederico quirks an eyebrow at me. This is a good sign. How do we play that? I make a statement, like this. If I get eaten by a zombie in the next thirty minutes, 
I'll regret never getting to run the Hard Rock 100. Five times I'd entered the lottery for Hard Rock, one of the most iconic 100-mile races in the country, and had yet to have my name drawn. I grin at Frederico. Now it's your turn. If I get eaten by a zombie in the next thirty minutes, I'll regret never getting to run the Copper Canyon Ultra Marathon. He sighs, more of a thoughtful sigh than one of true regret. I was saving money with the hopes of running that race for my seventieth birthday. With the world going sideways, I doubt I'll make it to seventy. Hell, with the way things are going, I doubt I'll make it to forty, I reply. Guess I don't have anything to complain about. He gives me a small smile. I smile back, relieved to see that some of the stress of the bonk is lifting from both of us. If I get eaten by a zombie in the next thirty minutes, I'll die knowing I finished Fat Dog, Federico says. Hardest race of my life. Kyle and I had crewed for Federico at the Fat Dog 120, a 120-mile foot race also known as Mountain Madness. The combination of a wet trail and slanted terrain caused him to rip subdermal tissue in his right foot. That had happened around mile 97. When he'd limped into the skyline mile 99 aid station, I remember the set lines of his face. His expression told me he was going to finish the race come hell or high water. You're one tough son of a bitch. I tell Frederico. I paid for that race, Frederico replied, eyes crinkling in fond memory. Only an ultra runner can look back on ripped foot tissue and intense pain with fondness. Remember when I had to use a knife to shave the scar tissue off the bottom of my foot? God, how could I forget that? I think you gave Kyle nightmares with that stunt. I laugh at the memory. If I get eaten by a zombie in the next thirty minutes, I'll die knowing that I finished the bare one hundred mile endurance run. That gets a chuckle out of Frederico. Winter had come early to that September race, and I ran for over ten hours in a snowstorm. In a pink running skirt. That had been hell. Complete hell. A cold, freezing, wet, miserable hell. I'd even gotten frostbite on my legs. But I'd finished. I'd come in dead last. Despite that, hell, maybe because of that, the Bear 100 is the single race I'm most proud of finishing. That was the only time I've seen Carter fret about you, Frederico says. That boy is as calm as they come, but the snow had him on edge. Here's to being tough sons of bitches. I hold up one hand and we slap high fives. After all we've been through, what's two hundred miles to Arcata? He says. Exactly, I grin. The heaviness of the bonk is dissipating. Even the worst of the hunger has receded. Things really aren't all that bad. This is how things go in ultras. They are an ebb and flow a series of lows and highs strung together by gritty determination. A joke or kind remark can be as nourishing as food. If Stout gets eaten by a zombie in the next thirty minutes, she'll die with friends. I reach down to scratch the dog between the ears. That dog's too smart to get eaten, Federico replies. She'll survive both of us. I laugh. True. If I get eaten in the next thirty minutes, I can go to heaven saying I was a dog owner. Federico raises an eyebrow. We've owned, and I use that term loosely, stout, for about two hours. Doesn't matter, I reply. She's part of our pack now. That denotes ownership. I think we're part of her pack. That means she owns us. We both look at the dog. As though aware she's the topic of conversation, Stout pricks her ears in our direction and wags her tail. I feel more energy returning to me. Not wanting to lose the little momentum we've scraped together, I plow forward with our impromptu game. If I get eaten in the next thirty minutes, I'll die knowing what true love is, I say, 
Kyle's blue eyes flash in my mind. I'm grateful to have had Kyle in my life. If I get eaten in the next thirty minutes, I'll die having experienced the many textures of sobriety, Federico says. I'm grateful I had the opportunity to give up drinking. Best and hardest thing that ever happened to me. Sounds like marriage, I reply. Yeah, it is, in a way. His voice softens. If I get eaten by a zombie in the next thirty minutes, I'll regret not being able to make amends with Alicia. This makes me reflect on my life. If I get eaten in the next thirty minutes by a zombie, I'll regret never going back to college. I always said I would, someday. Now I guess someday has come and gone. Why didn't you ever go back? Kyle always encouraged me to, but I was making good money waiting tables. I couldn't imagine juggling Carter, a job, and college. So I never went. Seems stupid now. It's not too late, Federico says. If our country pulls out of this zombie apocalypse, you could go back to school. I stop, planting my feet between two railroad ties. I turn to face my friend. Let's make a deal, I say. If we survive the zombie apocalypse, I'll go back to college and get my degree. And you'll start calling Alicia once a week, just to say hi. Even if she doesn't answer. What if? He pauses, licking his lips. What if Alicia is gone? I don't have to ask what he means. What if Carter is gone when we get to Arcata? I shake my head. We can't think like that. Our kids are going to be okay. I give my friend a look. You will call your daughter once a week, and I will go back to college. When all this shit... I make a vague gesture to the world at large, is cleaned up and the world is right side up again. Deal? Federico hesitates, then extends his hand. Deal. We shake. A shiver runs through me. There are no more excuses for me. If the world survives, if I survive, I'm going back to school. That's a pretty big if but even so, I can't help feeling a little intimidated. Stout lets out a small yip. As a unit, Frederico and I turn in her direction. She sniffs the air, nose pointed north. Without thinking, I draw my screwdriver. Frederico pulls out his hammer. Both tools are covered in dried blood and bits of sticky matter I don't let myself think too hard about. Is it zombies, girl? He asks. Stout cocks her head at us, then trots away. We hesitate for a few seconds, then follow. Several minutes pass before I realize we're jogging. I sense the moment when Federico has the same realization. We look at each other and grin. Another bonk for the books, he says. Another bonk for the books, I agree. We run for another five minutes, Stout leading the way. I glance down at my watch. Mile thirty-five, I say. Only one hundred sixty-five miles to go. We round a bend of oak trees, and there, in front of us, out here in the middle of nowhere, is a house. Chapter 21 Breaking and Entering The house sits in the middle of a large pasture, partially concealed by ancient, gorgeous oak trees. Stout stops and wags her tail at us, as if to say, See, guys, I knew where I was going. Federico and I crouch behind a large patch of thistles, taking careful surveillance of the scene. The old farmhouse has a deep front porch, peeling yellow paint, and second-story dormer windows. To the right of the house are half a dozen cars in various states of disrepair, all of them classics, two Mustangs, a Cadillac, and several cars with tail fins I can't name. A few hours ago, my first instinct would have been to see if any of the cars was in working order. Now, 
between the military blockades and the zombie swarms, I want to avoid all cars like the plague. There are two cows in the field to the left of the house, both of them dead. Four zombies, two boys and two adults, feed on the animals. A family, before the outbreak got them. And if a family in the middle of bum-fucked Egypt got infected, is there any place that's safe? Do you think we can get inside? I whisper. The property is surrounded by a pasture fence and topped with barbed wire. Frederico gives me a look. Do we want to get inside? If we're quiet, we can avoid the zombies, I reply. We really need food. He sighs. I know. Let's try the fence. We can dig under it. There are natural dips and rises along the property. We find a small stream that has burrowed its way under the fence. We claw at the moist earth, slowly widening the opening. As soon as Stout realizes what we're doing, she jumps between us. She paws at the earth, sending up great gouts of dirt. Frederico and I fall back, grinning at each other and letting her work. Within minutes, the opening is wide enough for us to crawl through. Frederico goes first, dropping into the muddy hole and wriggling through. I peer through the fence, watching the zombies eat the poor cows. They give no sign of having hurt us. I follow Frederico, grimacing as I slide through the mud. Yuck! Cold and wet. It slicks the side of my face and the front of my shirt and pants. Stout is the last one through. The three of us stay near the fence line, edging around the perimeter of the property. One of the zombies is a little boy, no more than seven or eight. His profile is outlined against the brilliant green of the surrounding grass as he dines on a cow's large intestine. The scene makes my stomach royal. A loud, low moan rolls across the pasture. I freeze, thinking we've been spotted. Federico and Stout also halt, all three of us staring in fear at the zombies. The sound rolls out a second time, and this time I recognize it for what it is. A moo. One of the poor cows is still alive. I look at Frederico. He shakes his head and continues on. There's nothing we can do for the poor animal without risking ourselves. Stout tucks her tail between her legs and slinks away. We reach the porch of the farmhouse. There are signs of violence, blood pools by the front door and smears down the steps. An overturned chair a half-eaten finger on the floorboards. The gore makes my skin crawl, but now isn't the time to let my nerves get the better of me. With Frederico on my left and Stout on my right, we mount the stairs. The old wood creaks underfoot. We freeze, automatically glancing at the zombies. One of them, the father, turns his head in our direction, chewing on a bright red cow organ as he does. None of the others look up. The father chomps away, white-eyed gaze rolling in our direction. The ten steps between us and the front door suddenly seem like ten miles. Eyeing the stairs and the battered wooden porch beyond, I see a field of landmines. One wrong step could alert the zombies to our presence. We go fast and keep our steps light, Federico says. Get inside and barricade the door. What if the door is locked? I whisper back. Logic says it'll be open, since it appears the entire family is out in the pasture with the cows. But what if there's someone else, a survivor, an uncle or a grandma, someone, or something inside? Frederico pulls off his pack, removes his shirt, and wraps it around his fist. If the door is locked, I smash through the glass panel. He gestures to the small glass squares that fill the top half of the door, then winks and holds up his cloth-wrapped fist. Holding up three fingers, I count down. Three, two, one. Tensing all my leg muscles, I bolt up the stairs and across the porch. I stay on my toes, keeping my steps as light as I can. Frederico does the same. Despite that, the porch groans and creaks like an old man— 
Only Stout manages to whisper over the worn wood like a ghost. We make enough noise to draw the attention of the zombies. The mother and boys lift bloody faces and turn in the direction of the house, but they don't leave their cow buffet. The father, however, rises to his feet, moans, and takes a few steps in our direction. Fuck! I grab the door handle, giving it a desperate wrench. Double fuck! It's locked! Frederico doubles back with his fist and rams it into the glass. In a decent display of prowess, he punches through a small pane on his first try. As he extracts his cloth-covered fist, I dart forward and shove my hand through the opening. Some of the shards dig into my wrist as I fumble with the doorknob and turn the small lock embedded there. I try the knob, and the door swings open. Stout, zipping past my legs, is the first one through the doorway. Frederico and I barrel after her. It takes every ounce of self-preservation not to slam the door. I force myself to gingerly close it. There's a deadbolt and a chain. I slide both of them into place, thankful neither had been in place before. That would have seriously complicated our breaking and entering. With only the doorknob being locked, it makes me suspect, hope, the house is deserted. During whatever violence had ensued when the family was turned, it would have been easy for the door to have swung shut on its own with only the bottom lock in place. Still, it's never safe to assume. Sofa, Frederico whispers to me, moving across ancient, nasty shag carpet to a stained couch in the living room. We each grab a side and move it in front of the door, then turn and scan our surroundings in silence. Nothing stirs. With the living room cleared, we move on. Inch by inch, we make our way through the house. I'm armed with a screwdriver and railroad spike. Frederico has his lug nut wrench and hammer out. We enter the family room. It's crammed with furniture and a large array of video game equipment. It smells like cat urine, a stench that makes my nose itch. A quick sweep of the room shows it to be empty. Next comes the office and kitchen, both empty. In the kitchen are three black trash bags filled with empty soda cans and beer bottles. My mouth waters at the sight of a can of kidney beans sitting on the Formica countertop, but I force myself to look away. We can eat when we're sure the house is empty. We move up the stairs, Frederico in the lead. Blood spatters every stair. At first I try to step around it. After a few steps, I give up. I need to keep my eyes up and not worry about soiling the bottom of my shoes. We find Stout in the upstairs hall, ears flat. She stares into what looks like the master bedroom. Fuck. If Stout senses someone, it can't be good. I mentally steel myself to the reality that I might have to kill another zombie. God, I hope it's not a kid zombie. Or a baby zombie. God, please, no. Could I stab a zombie baby through the head to put it out of its misery? I don't know. Nodding to one another, Frederico and I advance into the master bedroom, weapons raised. The room is dark, the metal burgundy blinds lowered and closed. The bed is unmade, the comforter and sheets in a lumpy mess near the footboard. Goopy red stains mar the carpet. The bathroom door is open. We pad forward, pausing every few steps to listen. I glimpse the edge of a toilet and yellow chipped linoleum. Scratch, scratch, scratch. The noise sends a jolt of adrenaline through my body. Heart pounding, I turn toward the sound. There's something inside the walk in closet. The door is shut, trapping whatever it is on the other side. Scratch, scratch, scratch. Federico moves to one side of the door, knuckles white on his weapons. He gestures to the door with his chin. I nod, sliding the railroad spike back into my pack and only keeping the screwdriver out. With my free hand, I grip the doorknob. My breath comes out in ragged, frightened gasps. Stealing myself, I yank open the door. Federico takes half a step forward, wrench raised over his head. A small black-and-white cat zips out of the closet, tearing past us and out into the hall. Straight into stout. 
Yowls of alarm fill the air, followed by frenetic barking. Chapter 22 Portland Malady Fuck! Federico darts into the hallway with me on his heels. We arrive in time to see Stout and the cat streak downstairs, barking rings like a cannon in my ears. Stout! I hiss, barreling past Federico and racing after the dog. There's a humongous racket from the kitchen, followed by more barking and yowling. It takes me a second to register the sound. The cans and bottles in the plastic garbage bags. They're spilling all over the kitchen. And from the sound of things, Stout and the cat are right in the middle of the mess. Stout! I race into the kitchen, fisting my hand in the scruff of the crazed dog. She strains against me, woofing madly at the cat. The terrified feline stumbles over several beer bottles in its haste to get away. It streaks out of the kitchen under a barrage of barking. I brace both feet against the linoleum, struggling to hang on to Stout. Federico strides into the kitchen, face dark. Without hesitation, he cuffs the dog on the side of the head. I suck in a surprised breath. Stout whines and stumbles from the impact. She looks up at Federico, ears going flat. Bad dog, Federico tells her, his face a mask of fear and fury. Bad. Stout presses her belly against the floor, tucking her tail between her legs. She stares up at Federico with pleading eyes. He ignores her, stalking out of the kitchen. A few seconds later, I hear a door close. Lock the fucking cat in the bathroom, he says, returning to the kitchen. You can let her up. Slowly, gingerly, I peel my fingers from Stout's scruff. She slinks toward Federico. He glares at her, then sighs, shoulders sagging. So much for keeping a low profile, he murmurs, gently petting the dog. A dull bump sounds from the side of the house. A heartbeat later, there are moans, followed by more bumping. I feel sick. Creeping forward, I lean across the Formica countertop. Peeking through the once white drapes that cover the window over the sink, I have a clear view of the south side of the property. The father and son zombies kick the house with their feet and claw at the siding. The mother and other son draw near, reaching out with their hands. As I watch, the father zombie inches to the side, following the contour of the house and heading toward the back. I jerk away from the kitchen curtain, as though the creature might sense my presence. It's coming around the back, I hiss. We have to block the other door. We hurry toward the back of the house, entering a room with a slanted floor that looks like it was once an outdoor porch. Somewhere along the line, it was converted into a laundry room. I scan the narrow room, looking for something to block the door. If I wasn't worried about making a racket, we could just tip over the washing machine. Over here, Federico hisses. In a corner of the room is a six-foot cabinet made of cheap particle board. He braces himself against one side. Understanding his intent, I position myself on the opposite. One, Federico whispers. Two, three. I heave. Thankfully, the cabinet isn't too heavy. Things rattle inside as we lift it a few inches off the floor and shift it away from the wall. We set it down, rest, then move it again. We shift it two more times before a broom falls out and clatters to the floor. An answering moan sounds from outside. I wince. Fuck it, Federico mutters. With a loud screech of particle board against chipped linoleum, he slides the cabinet across the floor. The noise sends chills up my back. They already know we're here. He grumbles, wedging the cabinet in front of the door. No use dicking around. Come on, let's eat and get the hell out of here before they figure out how to get inside. Back in the kitchen, he dives into the refrigerator, pulling out everything edible. He piles up bread, cheese, apples, leftover pizza, and a six-pack of Coke. I rummage through the doors, producing silverware and a can opener. Protein. Federico plops down two packages of lunch meat. Without another word, we gorge ourselves. 
I throw open the greasy lid of the pizza box and inhale three slices of what looks like meat lover's delight. Frederico piles lunch meat and cheese atop slices of bread, building a sandwich at least four inches high before shoving it into his mouth. With his free hand, he pops open a can of Coke, sucking down long drafts of the sugary liquid between bites of food. I polish off the pizza and start in on an apple, simultaneously heading for the pantry. Carbs. I place several cans of black beans on the counter. More rummaging produces several cans of SpaghettiOs, chili, and corn. I make my way down the counter, methodically opening each can of food as I go. Frederico seizes a can of beans and starts shoveling it into his mouth. I inhale two cans of SpaghettiOs. Stout woofles softly. Still on her belly, she looks up at us with woeful eyes. Without saying a word, Frederico upends a can of beef chili onto the floor in front of her. She pops up, tail springing to life, and eagerly laps up the chili. I dump another two cans onto the floor for her, figuring she must be at least as hungry as we are. Frederico finds a mixing bowl and fills it with water for her. I spot a radio, a boombox that looks like it was transported from the 80s, sitting on the kitchen counter. It's covered in dust, but otherwise looks intact. I make sure the volume isn't too high, then flick on the radio, and am rewarded with a classic rock tune. I tune into the AM bandwidth, turning the knob and scanning the stations until I find a news station. Unknown malady has entered the United States through the port of Portland, says the radio host. The CDC has erected a containment unit around Ground Zero. They are working round the clock to diagnose this unknown disease. All citizens with signs of infection are instructed to check in at CDC stations for immediate care. Though the CDC refuses to comment, there are rumors the illness is spread through bodily fluid. Initial symptoms are similar to the flu, fever, chills, and aches. If not treated within several hours, those infected begin to show signs of dementia. If left untreated, they will turn violent. In some cases, the infected have attacked and killed. There have been reports of over 300 attacks and 86 fatalities linked to this unknown disease. Frederico and I spend the next 30 minutes listening to the news while we eat and drink everything in sight. I'm so hungry, I barely taste the food as it goes down. My body burns up the much-needed fuel. Life and energy return to me, filling me from my toes to my head. We chew and swallow in silence, making minimal noise so as not to miss a word of the news report. Military checkpoints have increased. Every major road out of Oregon has a checkpoint. New checkpoints have been erected in neighboring states in the cities of Boise, Redding, Eureka, and Tacoma. No one is allowed past the checkpoints unless they submit to a mandatory blood test. My mind boggles at the scope of the outbreak. Authorities are obviously trying to contain it, but it's not working. Portland is under martial law. Citizens are required to submit to mandatory blood tests. Mobile blood banks have been dispatched to draw the blood while police round up citizens. Anyone found dodging the mandatory testing is imprisoned immediately. Frederico ventures into the freezer. He emerges with two gallons of ice cream. He passes the vanilla chocolate chip to me, prying the lid off a strawberry one in his hands. We sit together in silence, spooning huge mouthfuls of ice cream into our mouths. Flights in and out of Portland have been grounded. Military personnel have been deployed to all ports in the United States. No signs of the Portland malady have been detected at any of the other ports. Portland malady? Is that what they're calling it now? My mouth twists into a bitter grimace at the political sugar coating. Stout joins us, cocking her head and staring at us. With a shrug, Frederico spoons out some strawberry ice cream and plops it onto the floor. The dog chases it around the floor, tail wagging as she laps at the cold lump with her tongue. Joining us now is Charles Fitzpatrick, a member of the Portland Longshoremen. He was a witness to the outbreak. Charles, tell us what you saw. 
The longshoreman launches into a gory retelling of a taxi witnessed from a small bathroom window. Federico and I sit slumped under the dirty kitchen floor, leaning against the cupboards. We're surrounded by the remains of our feast. Empty cans, wrappers, and bags. Dirty forks, knives, and spoons. Crumbs, bread crust, and apple cores. I pull out my cell phone. There's a single text from Carter, sent about an hour ago. Fire somewhere in dorm. Going to make a run for it. Be in touch later. Love you. Holy shit. My smile fades, mouth going dry as I read his words. What is it? Frederico, seeing my expression, takes the phone from me. Fuck. He breathes. I take the phone back. Are you okay? I type. We are a few miles north of Hopland. I stare at the phone, waiting for a response. The longshoreman drones on in the background. There was so much blood. A minute ticks by. Two. Three. Staring bleakly at my phone, I resolutely wall away my rising anguish. Panic and fear will not help Carter. Neither will staring at my phone. There have been moments in my life where grief has crippled me. This isn't going to be one of them. Carter needs me. I'm not going to let him down. Mouth tightening in determination, I slide the phone back into my pack. Then I lever myself to my feet and switch off the radio. Come on, I say to Frederico. Let's take care of our feet and get the hell out of here. Chapter 23 Visitors Grimacing, I pull off my shoes and socks. My blisters are ridiculous. The outside of my left foot is filled with clear fluid, the blister about the size of a quarter. There's one on top of my foot filled with blood that looks like a kidney bean on steroids, not to mention all the small blisters on, around, and between my toes. I'm going to lose this toenail. I prod the big toe on my right foot, wrinkling my nose at the large blister that's formed under the nail. Yeah, I got a few of those, too. Here. Frederico passes me the blister kit, a Ziploc bag filled with sterile wipes, a few needles, a mini pair of scissors, liquid band-aid, and moleskin. We spend the next fifteen minutes cleaning, lancing, and bandaging blisters. We work in silence, sparing little comment for the blood, pus, nails, and dead skin we remove. My feet have been through worse. Hell, I expect them to be fully trashed by the time we get to Arcata. I'd love to take the time to de-sticker my shoes and pants, but there doesn't seem much point since we'll be heading right back out onto the railroad tracks. After I tend to my feet, I pull out the stick of body glide and reapply the lubricant to my hot zones. I rub it all over my feet, along the inside of my waistband, and across my skin just under the elastic of my sports bra. Frederico holds up his wet shoes. These could use a good thirty minutes in the dryer. Yeah, if we want to draw the attention of every zombie within five miles. Even now I can hear the zombie family scratching and groaning outside the back door. What about a hair dryer? I pull on my second and last pair of dry socks. Maybe we could use it in the upstairs closet to blow dry our shoes. It would muffle the noise. Good idea. Let's try to find some ibuprofen while we're at it. My back is complaining. I could use some for my knee, too, I reply. It still aches, though the worst of the pain has receded. What about weapons? This looks like the sort of house that would have a few guns around. Good point, Federico says. We'll look around before we leave. We leave Stout sprawled on the kitchen floor, bleary-eyed as she enters a junk-food coma. After a few minutes of searching the upstairs bathroom, we find a bottle of Aleve and a hairdryer. We both throw back three Aleve. I then grab the comforter from the master bed and drag it into the closet, using it as additional insulation against sound. I'll fill our packs with water and search for weapons, 
Federico whispers. You dry the shoes. Then we're out of here. I nod, pausing to look out the window. Downstairs, all four zombies cluster outside the back door. They bang and scratch at the door and windows. Shivering, I retreat into the closet. I press the blanket against the door, flip on the hairdryer, and get to work on Federico's shoes. After spending so long in silence, the blow dryer sounds like a lion in my ears. I've only gotten through Federico's shoes when he throws open the door, eyes wild. I instantly shut off the hair dryer and leap to my feet. What is it? I say, just as he says, we have company. Outside, I hear cat calls and shouts. Stout is barking. Come on, you dead fuck, I hear a man yell. Come and get me. You want some of this, motherfucker? Another man yells. You want some of this fresh meat? There are four of them at the back of the house, Federico whispers to me. In a truck. They drove straight through the pasture fence and went for the zombies. I crawl across the floor, heading for the window. Peeking over the sill, I spy four men. They look relatively normal, or as normal as guys waving blood-stained baseball bats can look. In jeans, t-shirts, and baseball caps, they look to be in their mid-twenties. As I watch, one of them swings the bat and whacks the mother zombie in the kneecap. Take that, you dead fuck! The bone shatters, and the mother zombie falls to the ground. She lands beside her eldest son, whose hands and elbows have both been battered bloody. The father zombie and younger son are also down, both with bloody kneecaps and legs that look like they've been broken. Yeah, take that, you dead fuck, says another of the men. He swings his own bat, breaking the mother zombie's elbow. My stomach turns. I'm no zombie fan, not by a long stretch. But there's something twisted and dark about the scene unfolding below us. The zombie moans, digging her good hand into the dirt as she tries to drag herself forward. Beside her, the teen zombie lifts his head and bares his teeth, Unable to push up with his ruined arms, he propels himself forward with his legs. Stout's barking gains a fevered pitch. Shut up, that fucking dog! One of the men pulls a handgun from the back of his jeans. Without hesitating, he fires into one of the kitchen windows. There's the sound of shattering glass, a yelp from Stout, then silence. My blood goes cold. Eyes wide with panic, Federico shoves my pack into my hand, then proceeds to jam his feet into his shoes. I stumble in my haste to pull on my still wet shoes. Landing on the comforter, I yank them on, then scramble back up. My hands shake in their haste to strap on the pack. Damn it! I hadn't thought to put extra food in my pack while we were downstairs. Wordlessly, Federico grabs my sleeve and pulls me toward the stairs. The shouts and catcalls continue outside. Break her ribs, one man shouts. Yeah, let's see how far she can get with broken ribs, says another. Sick fuckers, I think. As Frederico and I creep downstairs, my chest tightens with dread. Did that asshole kill Stout, or just injure her? If she's injured, how are we going to get her away from here? It's only a matter of time before those dickwads turn their attention to the house. If they'd shoot an innocent dog and torture zombies, I don't want to think about what they'd do to us. Just as we reach the bottom stair, and as the raucous laughter outside reaches new heights, there's a soft whine. Stout limps into view. I lunge past Frederico and throw my arms around our ultra dog. She licks my face, whining again. Blood runs down her right shoulder, but other than that, she's in one piece. It looks like she was only grazed by the bullet. Federico rubs Stout between the ears and gives her a gentle pat between the shoulder blades. Should we search for weapons? I whisper. No time. He replies, voice soft. We need to put distance between ourselves and those maniacs. He leads me and Stout into the family room. It's on the north side of the house, opposite to where the men and the zombies are. He opens a window and pops out the screen, then deftly climbs out. I hesitate, looking around for a chair or some other piece of furniture for Stout to climb on. The dog surprises me by leaping out the open window after Frederico. She teeters and limps a few steps when she lands, 
but doesn't make a sound. That's my girl, I think, scrambling after her. I land in dry dirt that looks like it was supposed to be a flower bed, even though now it's only home to weeds. A chorus of cheers goes up from the other side of the house. I don't even want to think what they're cheering about. Doors barricaded, someone calls. Let's break the window. Think someone's inside, another voice shouts. If there is, we can make ourselves some more dead meat. A shiver travels down my spine. I meet Federico's eye and gesture north. Past the jumble of classic cars is an old vineyard that hasn't seen a tractor in years. It's unpruned, the gnarled vines growing in wild disarray and choked with weeds. It's close, and it'll provide good concealment. Federico nods in agreement. We break into a sprint, running as fast as we can. There's life and energy in my steps, now that my body is refueled. I may pay for gorging later, but I'd rather be overnourished than hungry. Glass shatters behind us. A minute after that, the front door creaks open. I glance over my shoulder and see a man step onto the porch, the floorboards protesting loudly under his footsteps. He's wearing a plain navy shirt and a giant's baseball cap. He strolls onto the porch, swinging his bloody bat and looking around. We are on open ground, only ten feet from the concealment of the car graveyard. There's the barest instant when the man's eyes meet mine. Fear makes my mouth go dry. I sprint for all I'm worth. Guys, I found us some pussy, he hollers. Get the truck. Oh, shit. Shit, shit, shit. Frederico and I streak through the cars and practically dive into the vineyard, hunching down into the waist-high weeds. We gotta hide, Frederico says. We'll never outrun them. Come on. He leads me deeper into the vineyards. Stout is at our side, keeping up despite her wound. An approaching truck engine roars in our ears. Frederico and I run in a crouched position, moving as fast as we can while trying to stay below the wild, tangled vines. Untrellised and untended, the vines grow every which way and slap at our faces. As strong as the wine industry is, there are still neglected vineyards. Dead ahead, Frederico puffs. We'll hide in that. I hold up my arms to shield my face from the wild grape vines, trying to see ahead. All I see is a blackberry patch, I pant. That's right. As we draw near, I'm struck by the immensity of the blackberry patch. Left untended, much like the grapevines, it's grown at least fifteen feet tall and two hundred feet deep. It's surrounded by tufts of poison oak. Oh, fuck, I mutter. Are you serious? Dead serious. The rows of grapes are too narrow for cars. Or at least that's what I assume. Until the big four-wheeler plows straight into the first row of vines behind us. Gnarled wood and budding green leaves spray into the air in front of them. Have they seen us? They're heading straight for us, though with all the debris flying over the hood, it's just as likely dumb luck is leading them in our direction. Without warning, Stout veers away from us. Her shrill bark lights the air. I hiss for her to be quiet, but she's too far away, running back in the direction of the truck. I open my mouth to cry after her, but Frederico grabs my hand. Move, he snaps. I obey sprinting toward the wall of bristling brambles and poison oak. Behind me, I hear the men hoot as they catch sight of Stout. The truck makes a sharp turn to the right, veering away on a new trajectory. Gunshots rip through the vineyard. Instinctually, I turn, Stout's name forming on my lips. Frederico ruthlessly yanks my arm, pulling me to the ground. There, he hisses, pushing me toward the poison oak. Move. Another gunshot. More barking. Tires spew soft earth as the engine is gunned, more barking. Tears brim in my eyes as I crawl through the poison oak. The bright green leaves part, revealing an oddly large animal trail that leads into the brambles. It's about two feet high and a foot and a half wide. What sort of animal made this? Faster, Frederico snaps at my heels. I tuck my chin to my chest and crawl as fast as I can, heedless of the brambles scratching at my head and arms. The spikes claw at my pack and clothing. I yank myself free and keep moving, pushing deeper into the berry patch. 
There are parts so low that I am reduced to wriggling on my belly and pulling myself along on my elbows. Another gunshot. A high-pitched yelp. A sob breaks from my throat. I keep crawling. In the distance, the men shout. They're too far away for me to make out their words. I strain my ears, hoping to hear Stout's bark. There's no more barking. Only the indistinct chatter of the men. You can stop now, Frederico whispers. They can't see us. His eyes are wet with sadness. I collapse, curling up in a tight ball. I bite the inside of my cheek to keep from screaming. Tears stream down my cheeks. Federico squeezes my shoulder while I shake with soundless tears. Chapter 24 Bonging in the Brambles She's gone. That poor dog shot down for no other reason than the fact she'd been alive and a group of assholes was looking for violent entertainment. I squeeze my eyes, trying to squash the images that raced through my brain. God, I hope Stout's kill had been clean. I hope she isn't alive and in pain. The thought makes me cry harder. We'd only been together, what, maybe ten miles? But that had been a long, long ten miles. In that ten miles, we'd braved a zombie-infested hardware store, plowed through a nasty bonk, and eaten enough food to put normal people into a coma. I'd bonded with that dog in those ten miles. I'd experienced similar bonding in other ultra-races. When I ran the Lake Sonoma fifty-miler two years ago, I'd had the misfortune of running during a heat wave. My stomach had rebelled, and I'd started puking at mile nineteen. A nice woman, Kara had been her name, caught up to me as I heaved into the bushes. She stayed with me the rest of the course, buoying my spirits with her non-stop commentary on the beauty of ultra-boys in spandex. I still credit her with my finish that day, and, truth be told, I've never looked at men in spandex quite the same way. Kara and I have never spoken or seen each other since that day, but she still has a special place in my ultra-running past. My running life is filled with countless stories like that, bonds forged with fellow runners in the midst of grit and determination. The only difference is that none of the runners has ever been shot and murdered. Frederico smooths hair back from my forehead, still holding me tight. He doesn't speak just holds me and strokes my hair, giving me the time I need to grieve. He'd done the same thing for me and Carter when Kyle died. He'd been rock-solid and steady in the face of our incoherent grief. By the time my tears dry, my eyes are swollen and my nose is so stuffy I'm forced to breathe through my mouth. Small pinpricks of pain— Residuals from my frantic scrabble through the brambles cover my body. I turn my head, looking back in the direction of the vineyard. The men are still out there. It sounds like they're arguing. One of the trunks from the grapevines got stuck in the undercarriage of their truck. Frederico whispers, I think something got broken. They haven't been able to move the truck. Did they say anything about Stout? I reply, No. He squeezes my shoulders. Say goodbye to her, Jackalope. You need to get your head in the game if we're going to survive. Those men out there are pissed. They blame us for what happened to their truck. I draw one last shuddering breath, closing my eyes. Summoning a mental picture of Stout's black-brown fur, I mentally say my goodbye. So sorry, girl. Sorry you had to die for us. Okay. Federico asks. I nod. Good. He gives my shoulders one last squeeze. We need to move while they're distracted. You don't think they'll come in here after us, do you? No. But they could shoot through the brambles if they figure out where we are. Or light the briar on fire. 
bile rises in my throat at his words. How are we going to get out of here? Follow these animal paths. I twist my head around, giving him my best skeptical look. Do you have a better idea? He asks, raising his eyebrow. A better idea than snaking around on my belly trying to find a way out of this massive blackberry bramble? I think for a moment, then wrinkle my nose in resignation. The only other option is go back the way we came, and death is the only thing in that direction. Danger and poison oak. As if in response, itching shivers along my arms. I ignore it. No doubt I got poison oak on me. I'm not going to make things worse by scratching at it. God, what I wouldn't do for a bottle of Technu and calamine lotion right now. You know what they say, Federico whispers to me, when you can't run, walk. Despite myself, I smile. And when you can't walk, crawl, I reply, quoting Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., the ultra-running community has adopted his sage advice. Resigned, I flip onto my stomach and crawl deeper into the brambles. Sometimes the path is tall enough for me to move on hands and knees, but most of the path is traversed on my belly. A few times, when the path dead ends in what looks like an animal den, we have to backtrack. Did I ever tell you my bonging in the bramble story? Frederico asks softly. Bonging in the brambles? No, I whisper back. I'm pretty sure I would have remembered that. Shit, get ready for another belly crawl. I drop into the dirt. My elbows and hips are starting to get sore. It was something I did as a kid. My dad rented a little two-room cabin in Guerneville. It was right on the river. There was a big blackberry briar between our house and the neighbor's. I used to sneak into the briar with the neighbor's kids to get high. We called it bonging in the brambles. We thought we were so fucking clever, burrowing into that patch. We never considered the big pot plume we sent up with every bong hit. It was like a smoke signal. Needless to say, it didn't take long for Dad to figure out what we were up to. What did he do? I ask. Federico snorts. He confiscated all our weed but let us keep the bong. That night he invited me to get high with him. What? Having spent my adult life married to a recovering alcoholic, I'm unable to censor my horror. Dad spent most of his days high. When he found out I liked to smoke, he saw it as an opportunity to bond. It was one of the few things we had in common. You smoked weed with your dad? I have to repeat this back to him out of incredulity, not because I have a hearing issue. Yeah. Of course, our bond went out the window when I went sober. By the time he died, we hadn't spoken in almost ten years. He thought sobriety was only two steps short of suicide. We never could relate to each other once we lost weed. God, Federico, I'm so sorry. I've come to peace with it. I don't know what to say to any of this. In my own mind, I compare my straight-laced family to the image of a dad smoking pot with his son. Federico's experience is so beyond my own childhood I can hardly grasp it. We've been crawling around for nearly an hour when we hear the telltale sound of an engine firing to life. Cheers go up. They got their truck fixed, Federico says grimly. Minutes later, we hear the truck moving. As deep as we are in the blackberry briar, it's hard to discern the direction at first. After a good thirty seconds, it's clear they're driving in our direction. Come out, little kitties, one of the men calls out. Come out and play! I flatten myself to the ground, as if that's going to protect me. We're so deep in this fucking blackberry patch, there's no way they can see us. Even so, the animal part of my brain requires stillness and silence. The truck rumbles by, skirting the briar, then continues on. The heckler continues to shout taunts, daring us to show ourselves. 
From the sound of things, they're driving around the vineyard trying to find our trail. Frederico and I remain unmoving until the hum of the truck fades into the distance. Then we continue our miserable crawl. Twenty minutes later, the truck returns. It roars past the briar patch, driving in the direction of the house. There's no more taunting, and they're moving fast enough to make me think they're not looking for us any more. Hopefully this means they've turned their attention to other things, I murmur. Let's hope. Kate, do you hear that? Hear what? That. I strain my ears. At first, my attention is on the fading rumble of the truck. It takes a few seconds for me to focus on a softer, closer sound. It's a low rustling of the briar patch. Animals? I whisper. Yeah. Quite a few of them from the sound of things. We remain where we are. After another hard listen, I determine Frederico is right. There are animals nearby. It sounds like they're moving through the brambles and digging in the dirt. Then I hear a soft, distinct snort. Frederico hears it, too. Oh, shit. He breathes. Pigs. If you're enjoying this story, be sure to check out Zombinist Invasion, my Cold War zombie series. It combines the classic nostalgia of movies like Red Dawn with the mayhem and horror you'd expect in a zombie story. Available on Amazon, Kindle Unlimited, and audiobook retailers. Chapter 25 Pigs Damn it. Pigs. Did we escape from the baseball bat maniacs only to face off against wild pigs? I should have guessed from the size of the burrows we're following. They're much too large to have been made by rabbits, and too small to have been made by deer. They are, however, just the right size for pigs. Feral swine make their home all over this area. Farmers consider them pests, and regularly hunt them. Frederico and I occasionally encounter them on our trail runs around Lake Sonoma. They're notoriously bad-tempered, especially in the spring when they have babies. The general rule of thumb is to hide behind a tree and wait for them to pass. Frederico will occasionally clap his hands and make loud noises to startle them, but I prefer to lie low and give them space. Occasionally, feral pigs will attack and kill a hunter or unwary hiker, it happens often enough to give me a healthy dose of respect for the animals. And now we're in their den. They're getting closer, snorting and rooting around in the brambles. We gotta move, I hiss to Frederico. I wriggle forward as fast as I can, moving away from the pigs. As luck would have it, the path narrows to a tunnel too small for us to pass through. Back up, I hiss frantically. Dead end. He moves, body scraping against the dirt. I lever my elbows against the ground, pushing myself backward. Trying to see behind me is difficult. I constantly crane my neck, attempting to see even as I try to avoid the blackberry thorns. Over here. Frederico tugs on my ankle. I follow the touch of his hand, backing into a small round burrow. Frederico is backed up all the way into the brambles. I'm forced to spoon with him. He smells like a man who's run over thirty miles. Not that I smell any better. They're getting closer, I hiss. Just make yourself look non-threatening, he replies. How am I supposed to do that? Just, I don't know, don't make eye contact. I curl into a tight ball, hiding my face behind my arms. As if that will save me if the pigs find us and decide they don't like us. With one eye, I peek out between my forearms. A lone pig snuffles into view. He's russet brown with white stripes down his side. He noses the ground, scratching at it with his hoof and chewing on something, probably worms or insects. Pigs eat everything. I barely dare to breathe as I watch the animal through my forearms. He's joined by another pig. They scratch at the ground and munch at low-hanging berries. Over the next few minutes, Another dozen or so appear, snorting and grunting as they forage for food. 
my tongue, dry with fear, welds itself to the roof of my mouth. One gets close to me and sniffs. I clench both hands into fists, ready to attack. Federico squeezes my shoulder in warning. I forcibly relax my hands, biting my bottom lip hard enough to draw blood. The pig gets so close I feel his exhalations against my skin. This is it. It's the zombie apocalypse, and I'm going to meet my end by a sounder of pigs. They're going to trample us to death in this fucking blackberry briar. The pig leans in close. Closer. Then snorts, lays his ears back, and abruptly retreats. He trots away, disappearing around a corner. The rest of the animals cruise by without sparing us a second glance. Then, as quickly as they had come, they're gone. All the pigs, every last one of them, snorting and rooting at the ground, they disappear in a snuffle of sound. Federico nudges me in the back with his elbow. Good job, he says. It was your B.O. that scared him off. I let out a ragged, hoarse whisper of a laugh. Fuck you. It was your B.O. I smell like a fucking daisy patch. He chuckles lightly. I crawl out of our small burrow, peering down the way the pigs went. In their wake is a swath of churned soil. Federico. I glance over my shoulder at him. Our four-legged friends left a trail of breadcrumbs. Thirty minutes later, after following the messy foraging of the sounder, we emerge into the sunlight. I flop onto my back, staring up at the blue sky and sucking in deep breaths. I am now officially claustrophobic, I say. I don't think I'll ever eat another blackberry again. Federico sits back on his heels, surveying the land around us. We're on the northern edge of the briar. I can barely see the roof of the house, which means those sickos won't be able to see us. He gives me a relieved grin. Good. I roll over and climb to my feet. I hold out my arms, surveying the dozens of cuts covering the skin. Federico looks at his own arms. How long before the poison oak kicks in? I'm not looking forward to itchy sores coupling with the cuts. Frederico shrugs. With all the time spent in the dirt, we may have gotten rid of most of the oil. Only time will tell. I decide not to launch into a speech about my intense dislike of poison oak. It would serve no purpose right now. Daylight is burning, old man, I say. Let's get going. Slave driver. He companionably gets to his feet. We set off at a trot, heading north and skirting the old vineyard. To our left is open pasture land, a large swath cut by the truck when it drove through earlier. Luckily, there is no sign of it now. That way, Federico points. I can see the pasture fence. We need to get off this property and back onto the tracks. I nod, wordlessly veering toward the fence. We arch around the old vineyard. A few vultures make lazy circles above the grapevines. I draw to a halt, my stomach nodding at the sight of them. Stout. Federico stops beside me, following my gaze. Come on, jackalope, he says gently. We can't do anything for her now. We should bury her or at least check and make sure she's really gone. What if they shot her and she's still alive, and in pain? My throat tightens. She's gone, Kate. Make her death mean something. I hesitate, then nod. I wipe at my eyes, determined not to break down again. I feel like a complete shit, an ungrateful shit who turns her back on a friend. But I do turn. Yielding to Federico's gentle advice, I look away from the circling vultures. You know the worst thing about all this? I gesture back in Stout's general direction. What? Human beings were shitty even before the apocalypse. Chapter 26 Regrets 
it doesn't take us long to find a breach in the pasture fence. A bit of eroded earth creates a gap just large enough for us to shimmy under. It's nearly seven o'clock. The sun sinks in the sky, sending long fingers of shadows across the land. We've been on the move for nine hours, and we haven't even hit mile forty yet. We lost at least two hours in the house in Blackberry Briar, not to mention the time we wasted in Cloverdale trying to get a car and the time in Hopland at Ace Hardware. It's going to be dark soon, I say, seeing the shadows thicken around us. Headlamps, Frederico says. I nod. We rummage in our packs, pulling out the headlamps. They're stretchy bands of elastic designed to be worn around the head with a bright light mounted on the front. I slide mine on, snugging it down so that the lamp rests on my forehead. Frederico does the same. We click them on, sending out bright beams of light. Then we're back on the tracks, the two of us running north. As the day darkens, we're forced to trade speed for caution, and our pace slows. The tracks cross over a small one-lane country road. Nailed to a tree is a wooden sign painted with the word, Strawberries. Too bad it's too early in the season for there to be any fruit in the field. If I get eaten in the next thirty minutes, I'm going to regret never asking Marguerite out for coffee, Frederico says. Who's Marguerite? I keep my eyes on the tracks as we jog along. The pretty redhead I see every Thursday night at my AA meeting. Have you ever talked to her? All the time. Every week, actually. She always brings some sort of sweet to the meetings. The strawberry patch made me think of her. She made chocolate-covered strawberries last week. Did you eat any? Three. Best goddamn things I've ever had. Did you tell her that? Of course. I always tell her I like her food. It's an excuse to talk to her. I've been trying to work up the nerve to ask her out for two years. I laugh sympathetically. Why don't you just ask? She's barely fifty. Too pretty for me. I know how I look. I'm a grizzled old man. I abused this body for more than half my life, and it shows. That's a stupid excuse. If she's too shallow to see past your exterior, she's not worth your time. He grunts. My idea of a great first date is a twenty-five-mile run around Lake Sonoma. I don't do dinners and movies. Too awkward. She deserves a man who will take her out. I'm just not that guy. You could have taken her to Lake Sonoma without asking her to run twenty-five miles, Frederico. Why didn't you ask her to go for a hike or a picnic? Better yet, how about a hike and a picnic? He's silent for a few minutes. I never thought of that. You should have consulted me before the zombie apocalypse. Yeah, I guess so. You're an idiot, Frederico. Can't argue with that. On we run, the land around us succumbing to darkness. Insects whir to life, filling the air with soft background noise. Sounds that bring the illusion of a normal pre-apocalyptic world. At mile thirty-six, Frederico asks, what will you regret if we get eaten in the next thirty minutes? I don't know, I reply, though my mind immediately flashes to my son. We run a few more minutes in silence, my mind churning. Finally I find my voice. If I get eaten in the next thirty minutes, I'm going to regret being the person I became when Kyle died. I swallow against the lump in my throat. I was a really shitty mom to Carter. Bullshit, Federico replies, his vehemence catching me by surprise. I went into a dark place when Kyle died. I should have been strong for Carter. Instead, he had to be strong for me. The shame sits heavy on my shoulders. Even though Carter and I have a good relationship, I've never been able to shake free of the guilt. I couldn't function after I lost Kyle— all I did was sleep and cry. You remember what a mess I was? You were grieving. I was so fucked up. I couldn't even drive Carter to school. He had to get up early and walk. 
He made a sandwich for me every morning and left it in the fridge so I'd have something to eat. I usually hid the sandwiches in the trash can. At night, he'd make microwave dinners for me and fret over me until I ate them. Your son is a good kid. Carter is good. He's always been good. I should have been there for him. I should have been the one making him sandwiches and microwave dinners. I almost missed his high school graduation. Federico nods. He's too kind to rehash that dismal day. I still remember the low anger that simmered in me when my son pulled open the bedroom curtains, nearly blinding me after days and days in self-imposed darkness. Hey, Mom, he said, eyes alight with the same genuine kindness I'd always seen in his father's. Graduation starts in an hour. I picked out your clothes. Just jump in the shower and we'll go, okay? Uncle Rico is here to drive us. There, in front of me, stood my handsome son, dressed in the suit we purchased the day his father died. His face, framed by a neatly trimmed beard, was so earnest. Shaggy brown hair framed eyes as blue as his father's. The suit looked perfect on him. The blue button-down shirt a perfect accent to his eyes. The sight of it made me want to vomit. That suit was the reason we weren't home when Kyle slipped and hit his head. It was the reason we hadn't been here to save him. Sorrow felt like an anvil in my chest. I wanted to throw it at someone. I wanted to crush myself with it. I wanted the pain to stop. Just jump in the shower and we'll go, okay, Mom? Carter hovered in the doorway, not trusting me to get my ass in gear. Mom? It was his uncertainty that gave me the kick in the ass I needed. The anger and grief disappeared in an avalanche of shame. I was a fucking wreck. I hadn't showered in days. I'd barely eaten in the past few weeks. I looked and smelled like hell. And my son didn't trust me to get my act together. He didn't trust me to be there for him, to witness this important rite of passage. He'd already lost a father. He didn't need to lose a mother, too. I got up. I showered. I put on makeup to conceal the dark circles under my eyes. I even managed a fancy twist with my hair. In an effort to get my lightheadedness under control, I scarfed half a bag of Giardelli chocolate chips while applying mascara and eyeliner. Carter beamed at me when I exited the bedroom in the red dress he'd picked out. I don't think he'd noticed I'd forgotten to brush my teeth. Federico had been too circumspect to tell me I looked like hell. Instead, he'd said, You need to get back on the trail, Jackalope. The sunshine'll do you some good. Carter had to take care of me, I say to Federico. It should have been the other way around. I was weak when I should have been strong. I shake my head. Carter deserves better. We run on, our feet light whispers against the rotting wood of the railroad. Our legs swish through the plants. That, coupled with our breathing, are the only sounds of our passage. Mile 37 Maybe. If I can make it to Arcata. If I can get there in one piece without getting eaten— Maybe Carter will know I'm strong, I say. Maybe he'll know I can be there for him when the chips are down. If you make it to Arcata, Federico says, maybe you'll forgive yourself. Carter isn't the one holding resentments, Kate. I have nothing to say to that. Mile 38 the city of Ukiah glimmers in the distance. It's the only thing that qualifies as a city in the next one hundred miles. The town is large enough to boast a Walmart, a Home Depot, and legalized marijuana. Fuck this. Frederico comes to an abrupt halt. I'm not going out with regrets. Give me your phone. My phone? I stare at him stupidly. I'm calling her. Who? Alicia. I blink in surprise. 
then obediently dig out my phone. A quick glance shows me there's no text from Carter. Ignoring the tinge of worry that slithers through my belly, I pass the phone to Frederico. How the hell do you use this fucking thing? He swipes at the phone. I wrestle it back from him. Here. I pull up the keypad, then pass it back. Drawing a deep breath, Frederico dials. He looks like a wild man in my pink running shorts and polka dot compression sleeves. Curls have come loose from his ponytail, framing his face in sweaty locks. Alicia. His voice is low and tinged with intense emotion. It's dead. I want you to know. I want you to know I love you. I love you. And I'm sorry. Sorry for everything. I'm sure by now you've heard all the crazy shit that's going down. I want you to know that I'm on my way to you. I'll be there soon. Stay safe. A shudder goes through him as he disconnects. No answer. He mutters, passing the phone back to me. I stare at the phone, willing a text from Carter to appear. Nothing happens. Just got to Ukiah, I type. See you soon. Stay safe. When I look up, my eyes meet Federico's. I see my own worry and anxiety reflected back at me. Without another word, we continue on. Chapter 27 Zombie Rollers The two-lane road stretches into a bona fide four-lane freeway as we near Ukiah. The railroad tracks run parallel to it. We switch off our headlamps and survey the scene before us. At the south end of town, huge floodlights have been positioned on either side of the four-lane highway. They cast the dark road with blinding light. The faces of the soldiers are concealed by biohazard masks. We didn't see those on the soldiers in Hopland. A large white tent has been raised on the west side of the road. A blue square with a white silhouette of a bird and the letters CDC is painted on one side. The CDC is here? I whisper. Shouldn't their efforts be focused in Portland? Don't know, Federico replies. Maybe they found something here worth studying. Not good. A desperate need to find Carter tightens my chest. I pull out my phone. Still no text. My battery is two-thirds of the way gone. Despite this, I pull up the browser and type Ukiah CDC. A minute later, my phone brings up a list of headlines that make my stomach churn. Outbreaks in Northern California. Military deployed to halt spread. CDC blockade in Ukiah and Eureka. More reports of outbreak in Humboldt University. Residents in Northern California urged to stay indoors. Violent restaurant attack connected to Portland longshoremen visiting family in Ukiah. Outbreak at frat party in Northern California's Humboldt University. Military deployed to protect students. Shit. Federico breathes, reading over my shoulder. I close the browser and dial Carter's number. It goes straight to voicemail. Tears of frustration well in my eyes. Kate. Federico puts a hand on my shoulder. Keep your head in the race. Don't fall apart on me now. I swallow and close my eyes, trying to quell the panic and despair inside of me. Carter. Ultras are finished with the mind, not the body, Federico says. Keep your head in the race, Kate. Head in the race, I repeat, opening my eyes. He's right. Panicking about Carter isn't going to save him, and it isn't going to help us reach him. If anything, it'll get us killed. God, what I wouldn't give for a hug from Kyle right now. The feel of his arms around me would be a salve on my aching heart. But Kyle's not here. Kyle is gone. All I have is myself and Frederico. It will have to be enough. It is enough. I have water, food, 
and friendship. And a headlamp. I have everything I need to make it to Arcata, to Carter. I'm okay, I say, shaking myself. A familiar steel wells within me, solidifying my will. Fuck self-pity. There's a point in every ultra race where a runner has to decide to finish. There's always a reason to quit. Multiple reasons, usually. It takes a solid will to finish, to push through pain and doubt and excuses. I seize that unflinching willpower, wrapping it around myself like a blanket. I will see this through. For Carter. For Kyle. Fuck self-pity. I repeat, fuck self-pity, and fuck pain. Federico grins and gives my shoulder one last squeeze. We have to sneak around the city, I say, my resolve solidifying into a plan. If those soldiers see us, they won't let us pass. Yeah, come on. The tracks run directly into Ukiah. We step off, moving northeast through the open grassland. We creep along, keeping one eye on the soldiers. It's slow going. The moon is nothing more than a bare sliver, casting only the barest illumination for us to see by. A quarter mile later, hidden behind industrial buildings and out of sight of the military barricade, we switch our lights back on. We cut around the city, going through fields, vineyards, and oak groves. Our progress is slow, without a clear path for running— but we press doggedly forward. Neither of us suggests trying to get a car. An eerie silence rests over the city. No hum of traffic, no distant voices. There's no sign of the chaos you'd expect from a city in the throes of a zombie outbreak. No screaming, no outward signs of panic or mayhem. What do you think's going on in there? I whisper, glancing at the city. Federico shakes his head. Nothing good, Kate. I think things are going to get worse the farther north we go. It could. He glances over at me. One mile at a time, right? One mile at a time, I echo. Mile 45. We leave Ukiah behind, pausing only to check the map. We locate the tracks and continue on our way. This far north, the population dwindles to almost nothing. I've driven this route enough times during the day to know there's an occasional house, but in the near darkness, I don't see any of them now. Not even a telltale light in a bedroom window. With only the illumination from our headlamps to combat the darkness, it feels like running down a black tunnel. Miles roll by. I run often enough and far enough that I've built up a good base over the years. My body can go a good fifty miles, especially with proper fuel and hydration, before it starts to feel the effects of the pounding. When we hit mile fifty-five, I begin to feel early signs of wear and tear. There's a familiar fatigue in my legs, torso, and arms, though that's to be expected. With our last meal a good twenty miles behind us, hunger is setting in again. I'm also getting low on water. The blisters on my feet are more uncomfortable than painful. I'll need to lance them again eventually, but for now they're manageable. There are a few itchy spots on my arms from the poison oak, but again, the discomfort is manageable. My biggest issue is the knee I injured when I fell outside of Hopland. I thought I was going to be able to shake it off, but the aching has returned. It wants to stiffen up on me. I do my best to push on and ignore the discomfort. Quitting isn't an option. And to be honest, I've run through much worse. How's your inventory? I ask Frederico. My IT band, he replies, referring to the large ligament that runs along the outside of the thigh to the shin. It always squawks at me on long runs. He glances at me. How are you holding up? Just the usual, but I'm okay. Knee is irritating me from the fall. We have to find food and water soon. I know. I'm not looking forward to that. I wish we had different packs. I think of the larger hydration packs I have back at home. 
They're made for long, self-supported runs. Because of their size and weight, I only use them for longer runs of thirty or forty miles, when I need to carry more gear, food, and water. Of course, today would have been the day we suited up with smaller packs. I can't tell you how many times I've had that same thought in the last ten miles. At mile sixty-five, we reached the outskirts of a town named Willits. It's a small town with barely five thousand people. We need to stop and forage for food. The knowledge makes my stomach queasy. Something tickles the edge of my hearing. I put out an arm, halting Frederico. Do you hear that? I whisper. I tilt my head, straining my ears. After several seconds, I hear it again. Low, wordless moans. Is it coming from the town? I ask. I don't think so. It sounds closer. Maybe up ahead on the tracks. He brandishes his tire iron. I pull out my railroad spike and screwdriver, gripping one in each hand. Slowing to a walk, we carefully advance. Part of me feels like we should switch off our headlamps, but I know that's the scared, irrational part of my brain. With the zombies being blind, the headlamps will only give us an advantage. Another two hundred yards, and we see them in the distance. Three zombies standing to the side of the tracks. They walk in small, sightless circles, moaning softly. The light from our headlamps glosses them with the faintest illumination. They look not unlike the homeless zombie we encountered outside of Cloverdale. All wear clothes that have seen better days. Each has a frame backpack and a sleeping bag. They're young, perhaps in their early twenties. One wears a beanie over dreadlocks. Another has a big forked beard he's divided into two braids. The third wears a guitar slung in front of him. They each have a ruddy, tanned face. They're the faces of homeless young men who spend their days exposed to the elements. There's a layer of grime on their skin and arms, more evidence that they spend their days without the common comforts of life. The sight of the three men saddens me. What path did they travel to end up here today? Kate, Federico says, we may not have to forage in Willets. He tilts his head toward the three zombies. You wanna... what? I whisper. Roll the zombies? He shrugs. I was thinking more along the lines of spiking them and ransacking their packs. I stare at him flatly. You want to roll the zombies. You have to admit it has a nice ring. Zombie rollers. Despite myself, I laugh softly. You're insane. You want to run 200 miles to Arcata. You're insane. Fuck. I tilt my head back, staring up at the spangling of stars. We're both insane. I exhale sharply, then look my friend in the eye. What the hell? I'm in. I crouch on the right side of the railroad berm, weapons clutched in each hand. Frederico stands on the opposite side with his hammer and his lug-nut wrench. The wind blows, carrying with it the chill scent of rot. I nod, the beam from my headlamp bobbing up and down. At my signal, Frederico starts clacking his weapons together. The three zombies instantly straighten, heads swiveling in our direction. They moan, arms outstretched as they walk toward us. I scan our surroundings, watching for other zombies. The grassland and oak trees around us are quiet, rippled by the nighttime breeze. The first of the zombies, dreadlocks, trips on a rock and goes down. He's back on his feet in seconds, a determined moan rising from his throat. Guitar bumps into a tree, then quickly reorients and continues forward. Forked Beard is in the lead. He's the most nimble-footed of the bunch, his booted feet practically gliding over the earth. He's the first to stumble into our barricade. It's nothing more than a pile of sticks and branches we salvaged from the surrounding landscape. Three feet wide and one foot tall, it's just big enough to trip Forked Beard and send him sprawling. That's my cue. 
I dart over the berm, weapons raised. Forked beard rolls on his side as he hears me coming. My headlamp illuminates his yawning maw. His blind eyes shine like white marbles. As I dart in, one hand closes around my ankle. I yelp in fear and ram the spike down as hard as I can. The hand goes slack as my rusted steel punctures his skull. Breathing hard, I lean back on my heels and yank out the spike. Kate, look out! Federico's shout splits the air like an axe. I look up just as Guitar trips on the barricade and goes down, right on top of me. I squeal, twisting around to get the screwdriver between me and the monster. The wooden guitar slams into my hip and grinds painfully against bone as the zombie lands on top of it. Snarling, he lunges for me. I slam my hands against his throat, straining to keep his snapping teeth from my flesh. The screwdriver tumbles from my grasp. Federico darts forward, swinging the lug nut wrench like a baseball bat. It connects with the zombie's skull, making a dull thud. The force, coupled with the slick surface of the guitar, throws the monster off balance. He slips sideways. Federico swings a second time, delivering a solid thwack to the creature's skull. I wriggle free and jump to my feet, turning to face the last of the zombies. Dreadlocks bumps against the barricade. Instead of tripping, he pauses and lets out a long, low moan. He shuffles forward, straining against the barricade. Branches and sticks snap and tumble as he struggles to push through. But he doesn't trip. Fuck this, I think. I sprint straight at Dreadlocks, slamming both hands into his chest. He snarls at the impact and falls, landing hard on his backside. Federico barrels past me, vaulting over the pile of debris like an Olympic hurdler. He swings the wrench once, twice. Blood droplets sparkle like rubies in the light of his headlamp. Dreadlocks drops. Dead. I lean over my knees, breathing hard. Adrenaline roars in my ears. A giddy, mad laugh rises in my throat. Federico gives me a crooked grin. My headlamp illuminates the blood flecks on his face. He steps toward me, raising one hand for a high five. I laugh again, slapping my palm against his. Zombie rollers unite, I say. Zombie rollers unite, he agrees, grin widening. This is a single, light-hearted moment in the middle of a day that's been fraught with fear and uncertainty. I decide to let myself enjoy it, even if it only lasts a few seconds. Chapter 28 Purple Passion The first order of business is getting the packs off the dead zombies. Grab his arm. Federico motions to Guitar. We need to roll him over. Hold on. I have an idea. I bend down and pat the pockets of dreadlocks, searching. I come into contact with something long and smooth. I reach into the pocket, grimacing when I touch something sticky. It feels like dried gum or a half-eaten piece of candy. I reach farther in, smiling triumphantly when I find the prize. Check it out. I pull out a pocket knife, holding it up for Frederico to see. It's about six inches long with a rose, mother-of-pearl inlay. Nice. He takes the knife and flips it open. It only takes a few minutes to saw the packs off the bodies. We drag them a short distance away, then sit down to rifle through them. A general aroma that has nothing to do with death hangs over the bags. It's the scent of unwashed clothing and flesh. Beef jerky. Frederico flashes me a grin as he rips open a package and passes me a few strips. I greedily devour the jerky, relieved to have something in my stomach again. I dig through the backpack of forked beard, pulling out several pairs of dirty underwear and stinky socks. Yick! I toss them away. Next comes a shirt. Then my hand touches crinkly plastic. Trail mix. Nice. I pull out the bag and rip it open, dumping some into my hand before passing it to Frederico. 
Ten minutes later, we have a decent pile of water and food before us. We decamp the water into our packs. Surprisingly, there's enough to just about top off both water bladders. Most of the food is prepackaged stuff that goes well with traveling. Nuts, dried fruit, granola bars, beef jerky, and crackers. We also unearth hard candies, Twizzlers, and a few candy bars. There's a half-eaten roast beef Subway sandwich with a suspicious aroma that comes out of Forked Beard's bag. Federico pulls off the stinky meat and tosses it aside, then slices the sandwich in half. Beggars can't be choosers. We eat in silence, polishing the sandwich off and moving into the packaged food. Within ten minutes, we've consumed almost everything. All that remains are hard candies and a few granola bars. Those we stash in our packs. What do you think? I retrieve the stinky pair of socks that, at any other time in my life, I'd have discarded. What do I think about a stranger's dirty socks? Frederico raises an eyebrow at me. They're dry. I tug off my shoes, which is more than I can say for mine. You didn't get a chance to blow-dry your shoes back at the house? No. Ran out of time when those sick assholes showed up. A pain goes through me as I think of Stout. If we'd left the house sooner, she'd still be alive. If the world wasn't filled with assholes, she'd still be alive. With a sad sigh, I strip off my wet socks and inspect my feet. Frederico wordlessly passes me the blister kit. I angle the headlamp, studying the new blisters that have popped up between my toes. There's one under the middle toe of my right foot that has swollen to the size of a large blueberry. The toenail has started to pop off. The blister under my big right toe has nearly doubled in size, blood and clear pus oozing around the loose nail. With a grimace, I grab the flagging edge of the loose nail and give it a firm tug. It comes free with a brief sting. I repeat the process on the middle toe. Two toenails down, I say, tossing them to the ground. Eight more to go. I wrap the injured toes with band-aids. With luck, you'll have a few left by the time we get to Arcata. I laugh, using an alcohol pad to wipe down my skin. Then I pull out a needle and get to work lancing the blisters. This was the only part of ultra-running Kyle couldn't stomach. I squeeze clear fluid out of the first blister. We used to joke that it was a good thing he didn't have a foot fetish. Yeah, I remember. Federico chuckles. I think he actually turned green the first time he saw me rip off a toenail. I was on my own when it came to my blisters. I smile at the memory. He didn't care if I puked or shit my pants, but he wouldn't come near me when I broke out the blister kit. You shit your pants. I paused, glancing up at my friend. Only once? I never told you about it because it was disgusting. It was at the San Diego 100. I thought it was a really good idea to eat spicy Indian food the night before the race. I look away, aiming my headlamp back at my feet. I paid for that decision the entire 100 miles. I went through three pairs of running shorts. Kyle and Carter thought it was hilarious. They made poop jokes all the way home. Frederico bursts out laughing. I smile despite myself, keeping my attention on my feet. Frederico, still chortling to himself, leaves me to my work. He goes about conducting a second search through the backpacks. He finds Skittles, M&Ms, and another pocket knife. Aren't you going to check your feet? I apply some neosporin to the lanced blisters. Nah, they feel okay. He replies, I'll check him at our next stop. Whoa, look at this. He holds up a small Ziploc. At first, all I can see is a black lump inside. Federico moves his headlamp, aiming the light and illuminating the contents. It's a small glass pipe and a dark green plug of marijuana. No wonder our friends couldn't escape the outbreak, I say. Federico sits down next to me, turning the ziplock over in his hands. He's quiet, intent on the weed and pipe. 
The intensity in his gaze makes me nervous. Frederico? Hmm? What's up? I was just thinking. He sighs. When I first went sober, I used to fantasize about a time like this. A time like what? The end of the world. An excuse to break my sobriety and go nuts. My brow wrinkles with sympathy. I understand. Of all the drugs I used, pot is the one I miss the most. This, Federico holds up the baggie, was my favorite. It's called Purple Passion. See the little purple flowers? He holds the bag out to me. I take it, not wanting to leave temptation in his hands. Under the light of my lamp, I see the little purple flowers. I'd have the most fantastic hallucinations on that stuff. His voice goes soft around the edges, like he's recalling a long-lost friend. I went to a Pearl Jam concert high on it once. Everyone around me sprouted angel wings. The ground fell away. The audience floated with the stars. Pearl Jam's music turned into ribbons of silk and flowed around us as we danced in the sky. Another nostalgic sigh. That was a good high. I close my fist around the ziplock. You're not thinking of getting high, are you? He raises his head to look at me. The bright light of the headlamp sinks his face into shadow. After the concert, I drove out to the beach with my friends. We took turns taking hits. Each time we took a puff, we held our breath and ran as far as we could across the sand before letting the smoke out. No one could run as far as I could. A fond smile pulls at his lips, showing a brief flash of white teeth. At some point, everyone went home. I stayed at the beach alone, talking philosophy with a sand crab for hours. I lay on the shore, watching clouds turn into the Shanghai acrobats as the sun rose. He raised his chin, eyes meeting mine. I've told that purple passion story at least a hundred times. The part I've never told anyone is what happened when I finally sobered up and returned to the real world. I worked at a 98-cent store. Turns out I'd missed two days of work on my high. The manager fired me, of course. I loved that job. I could go into work stoned and no one ever complained or gave me shit. I pretended I didn't care when I got fired, but inside I was pissed at myself for fucking up a good gig. He looks down now, headlamp shining on his shoes. I was a fuck-up from a young age, Kate. If I took a hit of that stuff now, he gestures to the purple passion concealed in my fist. It would be the end of my world. If I'm gonna die on this run... I'm going to die as the best person I can be, not the worst. My grip on the purple passion relaxes. A moment later, I fling the Ziploc and its contents into the night. It soars through the air, momentarily captured in the beam of my headlamp, then disappears into the darkness. Thank you, Federico says. I got you back. I reach over and give his hand a brief squeeze before returning to my feet. I apply liquid band-aid to the blisters and tug on the dry pair of socks. Then I pull out my phone, holding my breath as I swipe the phone and check for a message from Carter. Nothing. I swallow and shove the phone back into my pack, refusing to let myself dwell on possible reasons for my son's silence. You ready to get out of here? I ask. Federico, who watched my silent exchange with my non-responsive cell phone, nods. Yeah. He rises, shaking out his arms and legs. Yeah, I'm ready. We need to figure out our next move, I say. I gesture to the tiny town about a mile away in front of us, illuminated by a scattering of streetlights. The tracks run straight into the center of town. 
No way do I want to go close to a town. Not with zombies, soldiers, and CDC quarantines. Federico pulls out the map and spreads it out on the ground, weighting the corners with rocks. The two of us angle our heads, illuminating the map. It's going to be slow, going around in the dark, I say, studying the map and remembering the tedious trek around Ukiah. Federico shrugs. We've both done our share of night running. We'll just have to move a bit slower and be cautious. He pauses, peering at the map. Look here. He points to a section on the map where the tracks veer away from Highway 101 and head in an easterly direction. The tracks won't take us more than ten or fifteen miles past Willets. Once they head east, we're going to have to follow the highway. I study the map, following the tracks with my finger. They split away from the 101 and run northeast for miles and miles, never circling back. Shit, I mutter. You're right. We're going to have to use the highway. Come on. Frederico folds up the map and stashes it in his pack. Let's get moved. There's a flicker of movement over Federico's shoulder. I move instinctually, snatching the railroad spike out of my pack harness. When the zombie steps out of the shrubbery, I fly into him, ramming the spike through his eye with brutal precision. His body crashes backward. I fall on top of him, grunting from the impact. I stand up, brushing myself off and extracting the spike from the dead zombie's eye. When I turn around, I find Federico staring at me. Damn, he says. You've come a long way in less than twenty-four hours. I look back at the dead zombie. The gashed eye socket yawns blackly. Federico's right. Compared to my first few kills, this one was practically professional. I'm a mom on a mission. I clean the spike on the zombie's pant leg, then slide it back into my pack harness. Don't fuck with me. And don't fuck with my friend. Would you like another free Undead Ultra audiobook? Head over to my website at www.camillepeacott.com and join the VIP Bunker. Inside the VIP Bunker, you'll get instant access to Dawn Patrol, the Undead Ultra prequel audiobook, completely for free. So what are you waiting for? Head on over to www.camillepeacott.com and join the VIP Bunker. Hope to see you there.